back is great to be back in Los Angeles. I'd like to take a moment right at the beginning of my remarks to convey one of the more important pieces of news you're likely to hear while here at E3. Tomorrow, May 12, 1995, will be Yogi Berra's birthday. Yes, his 70th. So we all need to prepare ourselves for a heavier than, unusual, heavier than usual onslaught of yogiism from radio and TV commentators. And if I may, I'd like to kick off the birthday observance by repeating my own personal favorite of his. When I come to a fork in the road, I take it. <laughs> now that's not only uh, vintage Vera, it's also good for kicking off speeches. It can even be construed with off, without an awful lot of effort to be representative of what I'm about to say today. I'm going to discuss choices. I'm going to discuss choices. And E3 works as a pretty good symbol of some change our industry is experiencing. Here is this great big show designed solely for interactive entertainment. CES, great success that it's been, was never really designed for us. It related better to an older culture. It forced some of the most creative companies on Earth to at least figuratively put on gray flannel suits and well sort of fit into a TV buying furniture selling mode. But even that worked okay until recently. Now interactive entertainment has become far more than just an annex to the bigger, broader electronics business. And frankly, I don't miss the endless rows of car stereo speakers and cellular phones. We've uh, We've broken out to become a, a whole new category, a whole new culture for that matter. This business resists our catastrophes. It defies conventional wisdom. But all of us, including me, understand it better. And sometimes, in order to do that, we give in to the temptation to simplify things. And then, invariably, we make mistakes. This morning, I want to question a couple of assumptions about interactive entertainment that I see gaining greater and greater acceptance today. Assumptions that I believe are mistaken. What are they? Myths, really. And like all good myths, they are persistent and persuasive. That's a joke of anyone in anybody's job sources. There are two of them. The first is about PCs and the likelihood of that platform eating the game business for lunch. The second incorporates the assumption that the success and failure of our business will always be measured by our acceptance among 6 to 17 year old boys. Let's look at them one at a time. It doesn't in truth take much thought to see why the first myth has become as prevalent as it is. Examining some of the facts of the PC is killer whale theory, we often find the following. Multimedia PCs have sold fast over the last two years. They are, at first blush, obvious platforms for the increasingly sophisticated games our audiences are calling for. And those PC sales numbers will be a compelling message to game developers out there. And you know, if I've just spent $1,700 to $3,000 or more on a new multimedia platform for my home office, don't I want to get as much use out of that expense as possible? Well, sure I do. Multimedia platforms have some technical advantages over TV-based systems, too. PC monitors typically offer better resolution than TV screens. And back to the developer community. If I develop games to the PC standard, I don't have to pay anybody a royalty. Another reason for me to look inquiringly in this direction. But now, let's examine these in a little more detail. Digital news and reviews tells us the fact 10% of U.S. households own a multimedia PC today. That's about 10 million homes. Now that's an extraordinary increase over the year before, when only about 3 or 4% could make that point. These are impressive numbers. On the other hand, 30% of U.S. households, and that number's about 30 million homes, own and use a video game machine today. We predict that by 1996, that percentage is going to be between 35 and 40% Now, if you're a developer interested in the big markets, where in logic work are you going to look first? Last year, a PC game that sold 200,000 units would be an enormous hit. That 200,000 units is good business by anybody's definition. But a hit dedicated to Sega or Nintendo game, on the other hand, sold 1 to 3 million units in the U.S. Now, with thousands of PCs games introduced this year, the average 
unit sale in that arena could be 20 to 30,000 units. Dedicated game titles are only coming out, of, out at a rate of a few hundred per year. So the average unit sale will be over 100,000 units and it will still sell millions of units. At this moment in time and for the foreseeable future, let's face it, Sega, Nintendo, and maybe a few others in our business are still the only real big game in town. Now what about this business of, hey, I just bought an expensive computer, I want to get as much use out of it as possible. Let me get off the academic level here and get down to daily reality. If we're talking about a young adult who just bought a computer system, has no kids, and might want a little diversion on his work platform, I'll buy this item all the way. He'll buy three or four PC CD-ROM games. But that's not a rule. That's an exception. It's far more likely that 23 to 42 years old, I bought my PC to work at home, to organize my domestic life, to try new educational software, maybe to join my friends and family on the internet, whatever. And yes, I have kids. And after resisting the pressure for months, I finally go out and buy a game for my 10-year-old boy. He's happy looking at the box, seeing the fun he's going to have. He can't wait to get started. And it tells you about that even as you're peeling off the shrink wrap. You slide that baby into the slot, hit install, and you get one of several messages. All of which basically say, surely you did not think it was going to be this easy. <laughs> Now we're talking time on the telephone pole with the software company's 800 line, their customer service people. We're talking more trips to the computer store. You're upgrading DOS, for instance, because of that pesky, insufficient memory signal. I mean, nobody told you that you needed 8 megabytes of available memory to run that game. Or you're reconfiguring the soundboard after you spend two hours looking for the documentation. And Macs aren't immune from all this either, trust me. So the story goes on and on, and most times it's for hours, and then finally the supreme moment arrives, the music pipes up, the animation begins, it's working. And then you realize, hey, I don't know if I want my 10-year-old playing anywhere near my home office in the business plan I just spent two or three months creating. So the next morning you make another trip to the computer store to buy a shell. That means every time you turn the computer on, he can only get to his game. But that means you need to take extra steps to get around this game. So why do we buy this thing anyway, you begin to ask yourself to entertain young Brandon or to help my business? It's at this point, I believe, that the prospect of spending a few hundred dollars on a dedicated machine that plugs and plays on a much bigger screen in a room far better equipped to handle your son and his friends starts to sound like a pretty good investment. I think people who dismiss the dedicated game platform have never gone through this. People who write about technology are, for the most part, pretty adept at technology. They judge computers, understandably, I think, like you might judge any high-performance technical machine. If it develops a work or two, that's the name of the high-tech game. But in our game, we know things don't work that way. If you're truly going to succeed in the consumer business, your product has to work perfectly, right out of the box, first time, every time. Now, is Windows 95 going to deliver the kind of idiot-proof operability that someone like me needs? I think over time the answer is probably yes. Certainly that's where it's aimed. But that's still a ways out there. And by then, the game business will be still further ahead in delivering the next generation entertainment experiences. Here's sort of a fact to consider. A PC that could marginally run some of the newer games talking about today will require a Pentium 120 megahertz PC chip with Windows 95, a 3D graphics accelerator, 16 megabits of RAM, and more video RAM. And that's not your average multimedia PC. This is power user stuff, hobbyist level stuff. And even if it were available today, it would retail for over $3,000 well over. Now please don't get me wrong, multimedia PC game sales are going to increase rapidly. It's going to be a great business to be in. And in the very near future, Sega will be getting into it. See, we're approaching the fork in the road, and we're taking it. But the truth is, PC games aren't going to kill game machines any more than VCRs kill the movie business. The myth I'm dealing with, let's not forget, is the kind of all-or-nothing assumption I see too much of. It will be PCs or it will be dedicated game machines. That's like asking, will it be sports cars or minivans? The answer is both do great 
things. Both are optimized for different functions. 70% of the whole video game business today consists of fast action and sports titles. A concept that most of the multimedia PCs shipped last year and this year cannot deliver. Most publishers today believe PC entertainment software sales will level off at about 20 to 25 percent of total entertainment software. But even this kind of market share predicting tends to miss a much bigger vision of the future of home entertainment. It looks at what most homes have now and extrapolates from there. I want to move outside of that box. I think even the amazingly sophisticated games you're going to be seeing at E3 today only hint at the kind of immersive experience consumers are going to be demanding in the years to come. That's going to be delivered by big screen TV, surround sound, home theater stuff that will move the whole question away from the level of will it be in the or the home office? Because it will be needed. This will be multi-dimensional, truly interactive experiences that will involve the whole family. And it'll take place in a room dedicated not to sleeping, not to work, but to entertainment. Maybe the real message here is that our business is simply going to be more difficult to analyze and predict. Remember, kids and adults alike are going to be more exposed to the fun and excitement of interactive games in the next few years than they've ever been before. They'll be seeing them on airplanes, in hotel rooms, and in their homes via the Sega Channel. Where the Sega Channel exists in our rollout markets today, we're seeing game purchasing activity increasing by 35%. The Sega Channel is the first online example of electronic delivery of games in a mass market way. We will build on that in the future with Saturn, and it certainly gives Sega a distinct advantage. Am I suggesting a Sega game plan be home by the year 2000, along with the chicken in every pot? Absolutely. But in the forms and platforms we haven't yet dreamed of. This is a business that is ready to explode, and there's room for plenty of competition. PCs are not the enemy. Set-top delivery is not the enemy. Not if you're the largest content provider of software, as Sega is. Now let's move on to the second myth that your life and mine will forever depend on the whims and attitudes of the 6 to 17 year old market. I hope some of what I just finished saying about greater consumer expectations will begin to put the lie to this idea. Because this once hard and fast reliance on a singular age group and demographic is changing and changing fast. In 1992, the market was 61% dominated by 6 to 17 year olds. In 94, the figure was 55%. Now our reliance, Sega's reliance on the age segment has dropped even industry average. In 92, 62% of our sales went to them. But in 94, the number had dropped to 51%. In other words, 49%, almost half, of our business is already with adults 18 or older. And that trend is going to continue. We're going to see a broader based group of agents and demographics buying interactive entertainment, period. Most savvy industry analysts completely agree with this. So the game companies begin to ignore those 6 to 17 year old boys, our original group of consumers? Do we begin turning down the heat on a former life support system? Let me use this platform to ease any concerns in that direction. Sega's answer is no. You'll hear lots of talk today and in the days ahead about next generation systems. The appeal to older players from those games will be obvious, but we're not forgetting the group that put us where we are. We will still make the hot action titles. We're not forgetting there's an array of budgets out there, nor are we forgetting the aspirations of the young observers of this industry. We've long noted that when you skew your product line toward the young, there's little room for growth. So as we begin to skew our products forward and toward an older, more sophisticated consumer, we're giving kids room to realize their aspirations. We have hot new products awaiting launch on all our platforms. As just a sampling of this, let me mention Comic Zone, a Genesis product that represents a whole new game genre, bringing the nation's number one print medium, comics, to life. <laughs> Game. 
For Genesis, there will be 55 new titles this year, for 32X, 40 new titles, and for Game Gear, 35 new titles. And as I noted before, the job of analyzing this business is going to get harder. Predicting revenues was never the simple population modeling exercise that we all wanted it to be. Now the variables we will all have to consider will require even finer tuned crystal balls. But that doesn't mean we're not going to work out. Let me take a qualify myself in this business of defining markets for the years ahead. Number one, two, and three in that list of qualifiers is that I work at Sega. I don't believe there is a company or an individual in the industry who has a better sense of the mind of the consumer than Sega. Yes, we got our start in the arcade business, learning about gamer expectations a quarter at a time. We've had to provide arcade entertainment so interesting, so compelling, and so addictive that you put quarter after quarter in it just to increase your score. And that means something. We are the largest creator and marketer of arcade and consumer interactive entertainment in the world. I noted that one of my best friends among the competition said in a recent article, our heritage claim was much overused. Trust me when I say this, if any other company could claim the heritage of 40 plus years of understanding the mind of the game player, it would. What it's yielded us is unqualified in the most important criteria for success in this business. We create interactive entertainment hits in and outside the home. No other company does this. There's a new consumer mind out there, older, more affluent. This is a group that has positively proven it can be drawn to gaming when gaming delivers the kind of immersive experiences they want. To those of you who point at Myst as an example of the kind of CD game young adults want, I say, that's right. And we'll do that kind, be uh, kind better on our CD-ROM platforms, <coughs> only our games will be faster, more sensually overwhelming, far more social and interactive. So what matters to this new consumer mind? It all boils down to this. People want a great, immersive experience that helps them relax, escape, compete, win, and most importantly, have fun. No matter what kind of tech talk you hear in the next few days, and we'll certainly be contributing to that, the game is what counts, not what makes it great. In early movie days, it was technology. The first to deliver sound, the first to deliver color. So too with games, the first to deliver great speed, First, to deliver realistic sound and color. Now, we believe our Genesis 32X and Sega Saturn technologies are better than their respective competitors, but we realize it's the software the consumer cares about. We're at the point where the experience of the game, the story inside the game, is what matters. Suspension of disbelief has always been the fundamental component of diversion, whether that diversion was books, theaters, or movies. Advances in gaming mean we will come to supply that component more effectively than any other medium. The interactive entertainment business is going to allow the Walter Mitty and all of us to finally, finally realize our dreams. We're going to become great hockey players, race car drivers, football players, <coughs> or for that We're going to move into find new worlds that were formerly only available to us in our dreams. Now this suggests some obvious changes in the games of the future. Side-scrolling games, for all the fun and success they brought us, will ultimately give way to newer, more complex genres. Now please note this, I said ultimately give way. A long time from now. We expect to sell millions of Sonic and other great side-scrolling games over the next two or three years. So am I talking about a revolution here? Not really. But I am absolutely saying it's time for the press and the analysts to take off their cautionary hats for a change, to move the meter a tick or so to the right, to see that this is an industry that merely paused to take a breath before resuming its stunning growth pattern. This is a $5 billion industry that was $1 billion eight years ago, and it's going to grow, my numbers, 9 or $10 billion by the year 2000, whereas the link is $11 billion. Okay, up to this point, a lot of what I've said has been pretty qualitative in nature. Do I have any historical data to offer you? Yes. Let's look at the experience today in Japan. Sega Saturn has already sold one million units there. 
We anticipate that Sega Saturn's first school year in Japan will yield sales of 2.6 million. Now, if you conservatively translate that to the U.S. market, we expect to sell over 3 million units here in the first full year on the market. We think we'd sell more, but the extraordinary success in Japan means some limits to the supply in the U.S. are inevitable. We believe Sega Saturn sales in the U.S. before Christmas will be in the neighborhood of 600,000 units. You may have seen some argument in the trade press between Sega and Sony about who sold the most in the Japanese market. Well, we did. <laughs> but the import of the sales figures go way beyond just who sold more in one key Asian market. Together, the sales are fantastic. They mean a broader market than we've ever experienced before. They mean we get to that nine or ten billion dollar number I referred to earlier. So how can Sega and others in our industry make this rosy picture come true? By going to the next level as quickly as possible and at a price as low as we can manage. That's how. But you do that. I can't speak for my competitors, but I do know the kind of products we're bringing to market soon are going to hit that bigger, broader group of consumers like nothing's ever hit it before. They're going to push the bounds of what great arcade technology can do. But they're going to do that on people's TV sets at home. We're launching Sega Saturn with great software. Here's the Daytona on Sega Saturn. Daytona is the number one grossing arcade game worldwide today. <laughs> Our audiences say they want 360 degree immersion great production values, super 3D visuals and stereo sound, games like Panzer Dragoon will more than satisfy them. And now with the help of my able and charming assistant, Tim Dunley, let me show you what a top arcade hit worldwide looks like on the Sega Saturn platform. Virtual Fighter is the best fighting game ever done. It's number one in Japan, it has a cult following, and it's already the top five arcade hit in the U.S. and Europe. There is computer modeling, animation, all of these fighters, including real fighters, real human beings, practicing different martial arts skills, computer captured their motion, and then you generate these weapons. We're generating many hundreds of thousands of pop textures polygons per second. Oh, you lost? Where'd you win? You won! Oh, good. Jen, <laughs> and that product on Saturn looks as good as it does in the arcade. And here's a quick look at some of the other Sega Saturn games consumers will be choosing from at our launch.
Now those games are either all done or days away from completion. Here's one that isn't done, but will be ready by Christmas. As Yogi also said, you can see a lot just by looking. And after looking at that stuff, I find it hard to believe young adults aren't going to find these games appealing. In fact, I believe everyone will find these games so irresistible that people are going to make the time and the budget to buy and play them. Is there developer motivation? Judge by yourself. More than 100 third parties are now developing Sega Saturn software for 1995, and we anticipate a full library of 80 outstanding third party titles on retail shelves by Christmas of this year. I think the bottom line, and perhaps the understandable bottom line, behind any media and analyst comments regarding market saturation, is simply blown away by this kind of product. And I'm not completely naive. I'm sure my competitors, well, due time, will be showing similarly outrageous oh. similarly engaging experiences that are going to be appearing on your TVs. The kind of technology under the hood of every Sega Saturn will deliver the leapfrog forward our new consumers demand. Sega Saturns employ an orchestra of engines for that leapfrog result. No less than three Hitachi 32-bit RISC processors are used for the main power. Two video display processors generate character and gameplay images and background graphics. A custom sound chip and a digital signal processor yields up to 32 voices in CD quality audio. But I said the message wasn't technical, didn't I? The fact is, parallel multiple processing, such as we employ on Sega Saturn, makes bit counting an obsolete exercise. If you want to, if you want to play that game, we could say Sega Saturn's 128-bit system, but I, but I won't do that. I promise, because gameplay, you know, the graphics, speed, control, sound, and game design, all yielding magic, not bits. Gameplay will be evaluated on the magic it provides, not on some technical notion of bits per dollar. And our marketing will exploit that. The full thrust of our marketing efforts will be directed to make the consumer know how he or she will feel when playing Sega Saturn. You and the consumers will be hearing a lot from us and a lot from everybody as our business approaches this new level. In advertising, for example, as our industry gears up for the higher tech machine launches, we're going to see some dramatic increases in expenditures from the business as a whole. For 1995, we're looking at a quarter of a billion dollars in projected media buys. And that's just from the major manufacturers. That figure is up from 125 million only a year and a half ago. 100 million of that quarter billion will be from Sega alone. And believe me, we don't spend 100 million unless we're confident of success. If you add in the kind of media purchased by the big retailers, such as Toys R Us and Walmart and Target, the figure balloons to half a billion dollars. A keynote speech is no place for a point-by-point -point explanation of our marketing plan, but I hope you'll forgive at least some details about one of the more obvious components of the plan, our advertising. If Sega advertising to the millions of teens and young adults we consider our primary audience has been, well, occasionally shocking, it has also been honest and genuinely funny and communicated enough sense of product so that those TV sophisticates, the cynical 14 to 25 year old, knew we weren't just preaching to them. Well, advertising to an older crowd isn't going to be any easier. In fact, I cannot imagine a product category closer connection between successful advertising and product successes. But we're not backing away from the challenge. On the contrary, I think we move even closer to the edge. We might even be establishing new edges. This is not going to be simulation of gameplay so much as depiction of how the game player will feel when engaged with Sega Saturn. Our vision is to replicate the sensory overload this kind of gameplay will induce. The advertising objective? 
to create such a desire for the game that they will literally sell themselves. Here's a 60 second spot that we will be running as soon as we can manage. Welcome to the theater of the eye. Ron, you come up your to the orbital time. How nice. We're trimming the toenail. <laughs> What's that? that ought to be equally effective in grabbing people's attention. Welcome to the theater of the eye. Thanks. It's been an honor. <laughs> 